Welcome to the Science of Success. Introducing your host, Matt Bodner. Hey, it's Matt, and I'm here in the studio with Austin, and we're excited to bring you another business episode of The Science of Success. We just launched season two of our business episodes. If you wanna learn more about what these are and why we're doing them, be sure to check out the season two teaser that we recently released. And with that, Austin, tell us a little bit about how these episodes are different than a traditional Science of Success episode. Yeah, so it's important to know that you're still gonna get all the great content you've come to know and love from the Science of Success every Thursday. These are bonus episodes with added value, specifically centered around business. We've interviewed some true titans of business in multiple industries from multiple walks of life. And what we're going to focus on are the habits, routines, and mindsets that made them the successful titans they are today. That said, these are lessons, routines, stories, best practices that anyone can learn from and apply to their life. You don't have to be a business owner. You can be an employee. You can be a student. Or you can, of course, be a business owner. But come check them out. You're going to come away with a ton of valuable takeaways. But we do have a bit of a business focus on these specific business episodes in Season 2. With that, let's get into the episode. Welcome to the Science of Success, the number one evidence-based growth podcast on the internet with more than 5 million downloads and listeners in over 100 countries. In this episode, we're joined by Guy Kawasaki for a casual discussion, what we're calling a fireside chat, where we touch on life, business, success, and many stories from the trenches of building companies. Are you a fan of the show and have you been enjoying the content that we put together for you? If you have, I would love it if you signed up for our email list. We have some amazing content on there along with a really great free course that we put a ton of time into called How to Create Time for What Matters Most in Your Life. If that sounds exciting and interesting and you want a bunch of other free goodies and giveaways along with that, just go to successpodcast.com. You can sign up right on the homepage. That's successpodcast.com. Or if you're on your phone right now, all you have to do is text the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44. Two, two, two. How do you stop being a victim, take responsibility, and make your life the life you want it to be? In our previous episode, we uncovered the universal principles of success with one of the world's top success experts, Jack Canfield. Now, for our fireside chat with Guy. Guy Kawasaki is the chief evangelist of Canva, a brand ambassador for Mercedes-Benz, and an executive fellow at the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley. He was the chief evangelist of Apple and one of the Apple employees originally responsible for marketing their Macintosh computer line back in 1984. He's also the author of Wise Guy, The Art of the Start 2.0, The Art of Social Media, and 12 other books. Today, we have another legendary guest on the show. Guy Kawasaki. Guy is the chief evangelist of Canva, a brand ambassador for Mercedes-Benz, and an executive fellow of the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley. He was one of the chief evangelists of Apple and one of the Apple employees originally responsible for marketing their Macintosh computer line in 1984. He is also the author of Wise Guy, The Art of the Start 2.0, The Art of Social Media, and 12 other books. Guy, welcome to the Science of Success. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, we're so excited to have you on the show today. Obviously, you're a tremendously successful entrepreneur and, and you've done so many different things in the business world. It, it's truly an honor to have you on the show. The honor is all mine. <laughs> yeah, at least it's mutual. How's that? The funny thing is I know one of the new projects that you've kicked off is that you recently launched a podcast of yourself. Funny enough, I don't know you, you, you know, I don't know if you went back and all looked at some of the archives of previous guests we've had, but we actually have a common guest already. Phil Zimbardo. Oh, really? Oh, cool. Yeah, that's right. Such an interesting guy. And I mean, truly one of the luminaries of psychology and, and such an important foundational piece of psychology research that really transformed. I have him. Uh, I also have Steven Pinker now scheduled. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, but wait, it gets better. So this Thursday, I'm interviewing Andrew Yang. Oh, that's amazing. And you've had some incredible people on the show. I mean, you have, what, seven or eight episodes now? Not even. I have like five. Since you're into psychology, you'll also know tonight's guest. Tonight's guest is Bob Cialdini. Oh, of course. Yeah, he's a previous guest on the show as well. Oh, so there are two. Yeah. Nice. And we'll probably have some more. I know, you know, one of the things actually that I think really 
this might be incorrect, but it seems like really motivated you to create your podcast. And, and I've seen you talk about this in, in TED Talks and write about this in some of your work is one of the things I really respect and enjoy about a lot of your thinking around business is that many of the things that you talk about and share around starting companies and entrepreneurship are really about a lot of these things like growth mindset and grit and all of these what I'll call soft skills or things that a lot of business literature, a lot of business speakers and thinkers never even mention or touch on or bring into the conversation. Well, I have a theory why that's true. It's because so many of these thinkers, speakers, podcasters, they come at it from they are thinkers, speakers, podcasters, and gurus. They're not doers. So my direction is I'm a doer who has a podcast as opposed to a podcaster who's interviewing doers. So it's a very different orientation. So when a podcaster or a guru says, well, you need to have vision and passion, and everybody writes that down, that's kind of like a duism, right? Like, oh, you know, thank you, God, for telling me I need vision and passion. I thought I needed other things. And so I think a lot of this stuff is just total bullshit. After you write it down, if you, you know, a week later, you go back and you say, well, okay, so now what? The nature of my writing and my information and hopefully my podcast is not you need vision and passion. It's more like, well, you need 10 slides and you need to be able to give those 10 slides in 20 minutes and your smallest font is 30 points. Now that is actionable. I really like that. That's a 10, 20, 30, 10 slides, 20 minutes, 30 point font. There's no BS there, right? You're either 10, 20, 30, or you're not. It's not about, oh yeah, no entrepreneur ever said, I'm not passionate. I don't believe I don't work hard. Everybody says that it's meaningless. I totally agree. There's so many platitudes out there in the business world and all the content that we see. Let's come back to this thing you talked about a second ago, this idea of being a doer. Tell me more. What does it mean to be a doer and how can we step more into doing into taking action i don't think there's any rocket science there i mean you just have to dive in you have to start companies you have to ship products i think that's one of the fundamental flaws of most venture capitalists and most venture capitalists are not or have not done so you know many young people ask me oh, so how do i become a venture capitalist you know how, how do i join that career and the answer is you should be a venture capitalist as the last job before you die, as opposed to the first job. And so a good venture capitalist will have been there and done that and can actually advise from a position of experience. If you went to Yale as an undergraduate, went to Wharton for your MBA, worked at Goldman Sachs, and now you're a venture capitalist, like where along in your career did you ever have to pitch a company? finish a product, introduce a product, beg for distribution, beg for a sale, pray to the Apple gods that your app is approved. You know, where in that Goldman Sachs, Wharton, Yale history of yours, did you ever have to do any of that? And now you're going to be a venture capitalist and you're going to tell other people like you how to do it? I don't think so. Such a good perspective. So for someone who has that trajectory and they want to start to really build the specialized skills of shipping, of selling, et cetera. What of those skills would you say in your experience, and you have a tremendous background, would be the most valuable skill set? Do you think it's selling? Do you think it's shipping a product? Where across that would you focus? When all the dust settles, a startup, there's only two functions. You got to make it and you got to sell it. That's it. And so if you are an engineer, then you have to find someone who can sell. If you can sell, you need to find an engineer to make. I mean, that describes Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs. Either one of them without the other could not have succeeded. It comes down to those two skills. And you know, if you look around the room and there's not somebody to make it and somebody to sell it, well, you don't belong in the room. <laughs> Yeah, such a crystal clear distinction and really cuts through a lot of the BS that we hear about businesses. And you're either on the making side or the selling side, right? And you got to figure out 
how to really dig into the weeds on either one of those. That's it. Because life is in the weeds. I had a discussion today with an entrepreneur and you know, she wanted to discuss, oh, like the pillars of our company, sustainability and quality and this kind of stuff, which I don't disagree with. I'm not saying, well, you should have low quality, you should have sucky design, and you should be socially irresponsible. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that when somebody gets up in the morning, I don't think they're saying to themselves, geez, if I just could find a socially responsible app to manage my time, or if I could find a socially responsible skateboard, I don't think that's what goes through people's minds. Definitely not. It doesn't go through my mind, I tell you that. And so the upshot of that is that we really have to think about and frame when we're selling within what actually makes sense for whoever the end user is, for the buyer is, you know, they're not thinking about it. It's a matter of prioritization, right? So take something, you're starting a t-shirt business and you have great design t-shirts. That to me is 95% of the battle. Now, if you have a great design t-shirt and you have a sustainable model that it uses hemp or, you know, I don't know what it uses eco-friendly dyes and all that, you know, when somebody walks into the surf shop or the skateboard shop and sees your t-shirt, the first question is going to be, is it cool? Not, are the dyes ecologically responsible? And again, I want to make this crystal clear. I'm not saying you should pollute the earth. I'm saying that you got to think about the customer's unconscious or conscious top priorities. Everything else after that is cream. And that's a great example. Coming back to the quote you said earlier, I thought was so profound and and yet really simple is this quote that life is in the weeds. And so often, especially when you're thinking about starting a business or something like that, you create these big ideas and these pillars and all of this strategy. And yet really, most often when a company or a startup struggles or fails, it's because there's a massive breakdown between the big idea and the execution or the strategy and the implementation. I'm about to publish the interview with Steve Wozniak of Apple for my podcast. And you know, from the outside looking in, in 2020, you could say, wow, the founders of Apple had a vision where they're going to have a, a personal computer that empowers people. And then there'll be a handheld device. There'll be a phone. There'll be a music player. There'll be a tablet. There'll be a retail distribution. There'll be an app store. And so they had this vision of how they're going to grow the company and achieve worldwide domination. Well, nothing could be further than the truth. I mean, Waz, you know, fell in love with making computers. HP rejected the idea five times. And he went to the homebrew computing company and they loved all the, you know, the fact that you could now do something with the computer. You didn't have to work for NASA. And so the first order was something like $50,000 for Apple Ones. I mean, that's the nature. Now, 25 years later, you can reinvent history, especially if you're Apple, and you can say, yeah, we always had this idea for you know this total ecosystem and all that. God bless you. You can reinterpret history. But let's be honest. At the start, It's two guys in a garage, two gals in a garage, a guy and a gal in a garage. They're making something cool or neat or necessary or fun. They don't have these grandiose plans. What's up, everybody? This is Austin Fable, producer and co-host of The Science of Success. This episode of The Science of Success is brought to you by the mobile app Best Fiends. That's best friends, but without the R. Best Fiends is honestly one of the best mobile games I've ever played. If you're looking for a truly fun and engaging way to pass the time while enjoying a great story, some awesome visuals, Best Fiends is absolutely for you. Guys, seriously, I'm already on level 120. Beat that. And I've been having so much fun loving the visual design, the challenging problem solving, and more. And the game is updated each month, so there's always a new look and feel. But see, what I really love is as you progress, the levels require you to think differently and use new tactics to get to the next level. It's really a true what got you here won't get you there kind of scenario, but in the best possible way. Best Fiends also doesn't require you to have Wi-Fi to play, so you can really play anywhere you are. Listen, you got to check it out. 
Once you do, email me at austin at successpodcast.com and let's be friends. Now, engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of awesome characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game truly is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. Again, that's Best Fiends. Think Best Friends, like what we're going to be when you email me when you join the game. But without the R, Fiends, F-I-E-N-D-S. That's Best Fiends. Check it out today. Let me know what you do, and let's play together. So in the companies that you've worked with, and, and you just shared an example from Apple, how have you seen people successfully start to step into execution and really bridge that gap between the grandiose vision that you see in the pitch deck and what the actual on the ground activities of the business look like? Well, first of all, I don't think you should have a grandiose idea in the pitch deck. If you were pitching Apple, you would say, we want to make a personal computer as opposed to we want to what revolutionize the information age. Listen, after your trillion dollar company, hallelujah, say that you want to revolutionize the information age. But when you're trying to raise your first million bucks, you're trying to make a computer. You're trying to sell cool t-shirts. You're trying to enable people to make graphics online like Canva. That's what you're trying to do. So don't put grand visions in your pitch deck. You will lose credibility. Great insight. And I want to come back to the your journey at Apple because it's such an amazing story. It's such a fantastic time and place in the history of our society in many ways. I mean, it's an incredibly novel event and experience for you personally. What was the inflection point in your career that you went from being average guy to Guy Kawasaki? First of all, I hardly put myself into the category I think you just put me in. In my estimation... The people who are that lofty are maybe Walt Disney, Steve Jobs, Thomas Edison, Elon Musk. That's four. I would be hard-pressed to come up with many more. I'm not in that category. I just told somebody the other day, it's funny. So now I have this podcast called Remarkable People. And I have people like Margaret Atwood, Jane Goodall, you know, Wozniak. Andrew Yang is going to be later this week. So I have people like that quality. And all of a sudden, as my podcast is getting more popular, the funniest thing is happening, which is people are saying, you know, I listened to your podcast with Jane Goodall, and I think I'm remarkable too. Can I be on your podcast? This is not Richard Branson asking this question, okay? This is, you know, Joe Blow from Blow Industries who wrote The Blow Way, self-published by Blow Publishing. I don't even know what to say. I mean, for someone to think that they are in the category of Jane Goodall or Margaret Atwood or Steve Wozniak, you know the old saying that you wouldn't want the club that would have you? You ask the question, when did I tip and become this amazing person? It's not clear to me that I've tipped. I don't consider myself remarkable enough to be on the Remarkable People podcast except as the host. (laughs) as opposed to the guest, okay? So there has not been that event. One could make the case for me that I was successful and visible evangelizing Macintosh. This is back in the 80s. You know, very sarcastically, perhaps even realistically, I am living proof that if you do one thing right, you can coast for a long time. That's a great perspective. And I mean, you've obviously done, in many ways, you did a tremendous job of leveraging your experience at Apple and taking that to a much larger stage. How did you, even especially after you left Apple, how did you think about the transition from that and how did you capitalize on your experience there to be a springboard? You might not want to actually publish this podcast after I tell you all these things. Oh, we want the nitty gritty stuff. Well, okay. So I will tell you the nitty gritty. There was never a grand plan. It's not like I had this, you know, architecture and vision for my career that said, okay, so you're going to start off in Hawaii. You're going to get into Stanford. From Stanford, you're going to meet somebody. And because of nepotism, he's going to give you a job at Apple, not because you're qualified. Oh, and by the way, before you join Apple, because of nepotism, 
you're going to spend the time in law school where you drop out and then you're going to go get an MBA. And while you're getting an MBA, you're going to work for a jewelry manufacturer schlepping gold and diamonds. And that's going to prepare you for your Apple evangelism career. That's a major disconnect right there. And then now that you're in Apple, you're going to leverage your visibility at Apple as an evangelist to become a tech entrepreneur. And once you become a tech entrepreneur, then you're going to become a writer and a speaker. And then you're going to go back and try to become a venture capitalist. And then you're going to do some more tech entrepreneurship. And then you're going to do more writing and speaking. And then some people from Sydney, Australia are going to reach out to you out of the blue because they saw you using their product. And they're going to ask you to join Canva. And because you're omniscient and omnipotent, you knew that Canva would be success. And today Canva is, you know, one of two or three Australian unicorns. And so you knew that was going to happen. So you pick Canva. If you want to believe that's the trajectory of my life, God bless you. (laughs) But (laughs) the truth is, I just fell in love with stuff along the way. I fell in love with Macintosh. I was desperate for spending cash when I was at UCLA. So I started counting gold and diamonds. And then nepotism, I got hired at Apple. And I fell in love with the database and I got pissed off at Apple. So I left Apple to start a database company. And then I fell in love with social media. And along the way, I got frustrated. So I wrote a book that was cathartic. Then these people reached out to me via Twitter about Canva. And then I wrote a book called Wise Guy. And in my interviews with Wise Guy, where I was the interviewee as opposed to the interviewer, I talked to many people who ran business podcasts. And I said, so, you know, what's your model? And he said, well, you know, my model is I sell six ads per podcast, two in the front, two in the middle, two in behind. And I said, okay, so how much do you make per ad? And he said, well, the one at the beginning, you know, 15 to 20, the one in the middle, 10 to 15, the one at the end, five. So I'm doing the math. I said, okay, so there's 15 and 15, 10 and 10, five and five. We're talking 40, 50 grand. I said, so you're telling me you're making 50 grand per episode times 52 episodes. You're doing two and a half million a year. And they said, well, yeah, kind of. And I said, why am I writing books? I should be a podcaster. God bless you. I hope you get that kind of numbers too. And I don't have those kind of numbers yet in podcasting. I don't have any revenue from podcasting yet. But so I'm trying to tell you that I fell in love because I love the medium. Unlike a book, you work on a book for a year, it takes another year to get it published. Two years later, you have something that's static. You get one advance. If you're really lucky, you might get more than the advance, but most likely you only get the advance. And so for two years, you work and you get your advance. Well, with podcasting, I mean, you can sell advertising 52 times a year, every year. Like two years ago, would I have written a book that included an interview with Andrew Yang? I don't think so. I mean, who was Andrew Yang two years ago? But with podcasting, I'm going to interview him on Thursday. The podcast will be out next Tuesday. What can you turn around that fast? So... I'm giving you this like 15 minute explanation of why there was no plan to my career. I just fell in love with stuff and did it. Well, I think that's a really important lesson, right? And and many people think that there's a grand plan or there's a narrative, but the truth is, and Steve Jobs said this in his famous commencement speech, that the the dots only make sense in reverse, right? And you can only connect them looking back. The lesson of that is fall in love with things and pursue them and find what's interesting to you and spend time on it. Yeah, but you know, to be fair, the career strategy of get lucky is not exactly too useful. I think in Silicon Valley, the way we work is we throw a lot of stuff up against the wall and a few of them stick. Then we go up to the wall and we paint the bullseye around that and we declare victory. We say, oh, I hit the bullseye. You can always hit the bullseye. If you paint the bullseye after, you see what's stuck in the wall. And so, listen, when Canva has a liquidity event, You know, knock on wood, it'll be highly successful, and I'll make a boatload of money. I'm going to retroactively tell the story that I knew Canva would be successful. I knew. I knew it. I knew the team was good. I knew the market was good. I knew the technology was good. The truth is they reached out to me, and I got lucky. Do you think that people can manufacture their own luck? Depends how you define the word manufacture. So let's take the case of Canva. So. 
lots of factors happened there. One is my social media person was using Canva. Thank God I had a social media person who knew what she was doing, who had the good sense and judgment and taste to use Canva. What do you call that? You call that luck or skill in having a good social media person, you know, recognizing talent. And then I had to be open enough where if you use the traditional test, you'd say, well, is this a proven team? The Canva team six years ago, not proven. Was it a proven market? No. Was there proven technology? No. Were there like a huge competitor that could scare the crap out of you? Yes, Adobe. So if you look at all of those things, you would have said, there's no way you should do Canva. And yet here we are. So I think as I get older, I've come to the belief that it's better to be lucky than smart. Very interesting. And the flip side of that, though, is that Canva didn't reach out to me and ask me to be their chief brand evangelist. Through serendipity, through hard work, through random chance, through a combination of all of those things, you built a platform over time that made you an attractive candidate for that. Yes, that is true. But I don't want you to think that 20 or 30 years I sat down and I said, I have to make myself into a brand and be visible so that opportunities will find me. Maybe some people are that cogent and smart, but not me. I just did what I had to do to make a living and enjoy myself. I think there's some really interesting lessons that come out of that. And it's a great perspective. And it's contra to a lot of what you hear people talking about and sharing. One of the dangers, I will tell you, about listening to a podcast like this with a person like me, but really any podcast with any person, is it's very tricky to understand the difference between a good story and the truth and probability and whatever, right? So to give you a very cogent choice that many entrepreneurs have to pick, there's sort of two streams of thought, right? So one is you're quick to fail, you pivot fast. The other theory is you believe and you gut it out. People tell you, you know, it'll never work, it can't be done, but you believe that you stuck it out. Or you tried this, it didn't work, you pivoted quickly. Now those two things are 180 degrees apart. Which one is the right way? Well, it depends on which story you heard, right? And so it's very difficult to do anything scientific where you're controlling all the variables and testing a hypothesis. So equal team, equal technology, equal market, equal everything. One team pivots, one team sticks it out. Let's see what happens. You cannot conduct that experiment. And so I just caution listeners of this podcast and really any podcast is don't believe that a good story is necessarily scientifically sound. On the other hand, every once in a while, there is a black swan. There is a unicorn. So it happens. But just be cognizant of the difference between correlation and causation and the self-selection. You only hear about successful people on podcasts, because guess what? People like you don't ask failures to come on our podcast. Again, I think that's such an interesting take on it. And the survivorship bias is obviously true. And there's so many factors out there when you're trying to evaluate why was someone successful? How did they achieve what they achieved? Was it luck? Was it skill? Was it chance? Was it hard work? I mean, in many ways, all of these questions and thoughts have formed the foundation for this podcast. And and that's why we embarked on the journey and tried to figure out if we look across a wide array of phenomena and everything from athletics to neuroscience to psychology to business, can we pull out some commonalities? Can we find a few threads that in some ways, even in hindsight, connect the dots? You know, is science a perfect guide? Certainly not. I try to sort of get the ground as firm as I can get it to take another step and then figure out where the next step is going to go from there. I think I can offer some insights in how to at least improve the probability of success. I think that one of the richest veins for successful tech companies is a guy, a gal, two guys, two gals, a guy and a gal who are making the product that they want to use without any indication that it's any more than those people who want to use it. 
So now that sounds completely anti MBA market research, et cetera, et cetera. And I realize what I'm saying. But I think if you look at history, that's one of the richest veins that two people created something they wanted to use and come to find out they weren't the only two people. You could make the case that that describes Apple. That is very different from, well, let's read the latest edition of Wired. And Wired says, you know, the Internet of Things will be big. So let's go make an Internet of Things company. I also think that in terms of hiring people and finding people, the common wisdom is you look for people with the relevant work experience and the relevant educational degree. I would make the case that if you do that, you're going to shut yourself off from some of the most talented people in the world who on paper you know, don't have a PhD from Yale or Carnegie Mellon or Stanford, haven't worked in the industry, aren't so-called proven. I think you look for people who get it and love it and want to dent the universe and want to change history and want to create a device they want to use. That should be at least a third quality. And if you were to ask me, well, stack rank the qualities. Let's call that quality in general sort of passion or love of what you do. I would rank that above education and work experience. Both of those are great pieces of advice. And obviously, you have come from the trenches of many Silicon Valley startups and and seen what has really worked, what hasn't worked. I'm curious, do you think that, for example, the two founders or handful of founders building something for themselves, do you think that there's almost a selection bias inherent in that model in the sense that like a number of massively successful companies have followed that, but maybe the proportion of companies that pursue that, that succeed might actually be lower than the companies that let's say are the cold capitalist MBAs that go after whatever the hot new market segment is. If I had the bandwidth, you could probably test that theory. I don't know the answer to that theory. This gets back to what I said a few minutes ago. So if you look at Silicon Valley, or you say, well, two guys started Apple, two guys started Google, two guys started Yahoo. You know, we're seeing a pattern here. Not that it's two men, because I wish that were true. I wish I could cite, you know, as many examples of two women starting. It's not the gender necessarily as much as it's two people, one maker, one seller, creating the product they want to use. They were an unproven team in an unproven market with an unproven technology. Besides that, it was guaranteed that they would succeed. And that's the richest vein. I think, I'm not saying it's a 100% vein, but I think for entrepreneurships or entrepreneurship, it's all about increasing the probability. You know, I'm not suggesting you just randomly drill a hole wherever you can. This episode of The Science of Success is brought to you once again by our incredible sponsors at Brilliant. Go to www.brilliant.org slash science of success to learn more. For a limited time, the first 200 of our listeners to sign up get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Brilliant is a math and science learning platform, and their mission is to inspire and develop people to achieve their goals in STEM learning. I love it. The courses Brilliant offer explore the laws that shape our world and elevate math and science from something to be feared to a delightful experience. What I love about Brilliant is that they make all this learning so fun and interactive with puzzles that feel like games but have tremendous teaching and value with them. Brilliant offers a wide range of content like interactive courses on topics from mathematics to quantitative finance, scientific thinking, all the way to programming. On our show, we dig into the importance of learning how to learn and building frameworks for problem solving. That's why I can't think of a better sponsor for our show than Brilliant because they help you do just that. Go check them out today. Brilliant is giving away 20% off their premium annual subscription to our first 200 listeners to go to www.brilliant.org slash science of success. Go today and get started. Again, that's www.brilliant.org slash science of success. Coming back to one of the opposing mental models that you shared earlier on whether we should pivot 
quickly or whether we should stick it out and be diehard believers. Where do you fall on that spectrum and where have you seen companies be the most successful? I am completely confused by what one should do. Because for every example of one, I can find another example, right? A mini example. When Apple started the Apple retail store, every expert in the world said there's no freaking way that Apple can be successful paying those kind of shopping mall rents for a single product company or you know a single brand company. So Apple believed and stuck it out, and here we are today. You know, on the other hand, Google started as a like a IT consulting company, not a search engine, right? So that's an example of pivoting. I don't know if there's a right answer that you should pivot or you should stick it out. And the only way you're going to know is experimentation. The problem is that you and I are only going to hear about the successes. And so that's going to color our judgment. It could be that the only company that ever pivoted succeeded. So why are we telling everybody, well, look at that company. See why pivoting is the right way to go? I really like the point about embracing experimentation and figuring things out. To me, even you cited earlier Thomas Edison as an example of a truly luminary thinker and achiever. And one of my favorite psychology studies is, is the research from Dean Keith Simonton that Adam Grant really popularized in the book Originals around the output of creatives. And it comes back to what you said earlier about how startups and successful startups in Silicon Valley really are just throwing things against the wall and then painting the bullseye afterwards. In many ways, a lot of the research around whether it's patent grants or musical compositions or famous art, the most successful, most well-known, most eminent creators is the term they use in the research, were people who had an insane amount of output, thousands or tens of thousands of, of pieces of work. And a handful of those happened to be really successful. And even amongst those great creators, another really interesting thing that I found was that they didn't have any ability to foresee in advance whether their work would be the success. And so even if they hit a home run, you know, even a Mozart would put out a piece and say, this is my magnum opus, and then it would flop and he would have some composition he wrote in 15 minutes that was a throwaway that ended up becoming a masterpiece. Well, and it could also take 100 years before the masterpiece is recognized, right? That's totally true. I thought of another thing. I thought of another indicator of the potential for success, which is poor social skills. I would make the case that entrepreneurs who are not the shuck and jive popular kind of, you know, high school quarterback prom queen are the successful ones. I think it's the nerds with dyslexia, ADHD, and Asperger's who build great companies. Another thing you could look for is that they come from poor families. I think there's a logic to be said that the great companies are started by first or second generation immigrants. And by the time you get to the third or fourth generation, those people are silver platter kids. I'm not saying that I'm not guilty of this, okay? I'm just telling you that if you look at it, wow, the first or second generation are the ones that really built the business, right? By the third generation, you know, they were in the right preschool, they were right in the private school, they were choosing between Harvard, Dartmouth, Yale, and Brown. And then they were choosing between Carnegie Mellon and University of Chicago and Wharton for their MBA. And then they had offers from Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley and Accenture and McKinsey. That's the third and fourth generation. So I guess I'm telling you to look for the downtrodden masses who are socially not as accepted Having said all that, one of the ramifications of today's political system is it's completely geared against preventing those kind of immigrants, which is going to bite us in the ass. I want to change gears a little bit and come back to something that you said in a TED Talk of yours that I found really interesting that I wanted to explore a little bit more, which was the idea of enabling people to pay you back. Tell me a little bit more about that because I thought it was really insightful. Well, first of all, that idea I stole from Bob Cialdini, so I, you know, I want to give credit where credit is due. Bob Cialdini's theory is that society is built upon reciprocation. 
And I don't mean the kind of quid pro quo, tit for tat, you find dirt on Biden, I'll send you military aid. I'm not talking about that kind of reciprocation. I'm talking about karmic good, do good in advance, you show appreciation kind of reciprocation. But a lot of people believe that the ultimate form of the high road is you did a favor for me. I want to thank you. And that's it. And then the person you're thanking says, oh, yeah, you're welcome, but forget about it. It's no problem. It was my pleasure. That's not the optimal situation. The optimal situation is the person that has received the favor tells you how to pay you back so that you can pay the person back, clear the decks, and then you can do more for each other. So here's a real world example, right? So let's say that you thank me for appearing on your podcast. I say, hey, no problem. It was only an hour. I enjoyed myself. You know, it was a good opportunity for me too. Okay, that's one answer. But the better answer is, you know what? Yeah, I was glad to be on there. I hope I provided information for your listeners. And by the way, I just started my podcast. How about in your podcast, you tell people to listen to my podcast? That's a better answer. It's a better answer for me because obviously I get more promotion, but it's a better answer for you too because now you can say, huh, I can help a guy back. And then the next time you contact me, I'll say, huh, that guy reciprocated. I should help him again. I love that. Yeah, it's starting off a positive chain of reciprocal helping each other. It reminds me of, I don't know if you've ever heard of kidney chains or when people go to a coffee shop and they buy the coffee for the person in front of them. And then and that is similar, creates kind of a chain of positive sentiment and paying it forward, essentially. I like that theory. I think it's a very cute story, but that's not exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying that when somebody does something for you, it's okay for you to tell them how to pay you back. You are doing them a favor. That's different than, you know, I buy coffee for the next person in the Starbucks line. Yeah, I totally get what you're saying. I think that's a great perspective. In many ways, I feel like in our society, it's so hard to ask right? To to ask for a favor, to ask for something. There's almost a little bit of a social taboo against doing that. How have you pushed yourself through that or or made it so, you know, been able to get yourself to ask for something when the social convention prevents you from doing that? Sometimes it drives my wife crazy that I do this, but uh, I don't know. I mean, I've never had somebody say, how dare you ask? I mean, you know, I'll tell you one thing. One of the ramifications of having this attitude is that if you know you're going to tell the person how to pay you back, I think it encourages you to help more at the front, right? Because if you know you're going to ask for something in return, then you say, she, I know I'm going to ask for something in return. I better really deliver now. So maybe it's an upward spiral. It makes everything better. You do more, you get more. Let's paint the other position, right? So let's say that you never listened to this podcast. It's never occurred to you to tell people how to pay you back. You're sitting there and you're kind of a zero-sum game, closed mindset, a non-growth mindset. So you think, huh, why should I do this asshole a favor? I mean, I'm never going to get anything back. It's never going to help me. Or you can say, yeah, you know, I'm going to ask him to help me. So she is. I should do something really great for him. So he does something really great for me. I mean, you could say I'm being manipulative and all that, but I don't know. I mean, I've developed a lot of close relationships because of that attitude. I have to tell you. I think categorizing it as an upward spiral is a really thoughtful way to think about it. And I also really like the perspective of if you know you're going to ask for something on the back end, it really drives you to make sure you're delivering as much value as possible on the front end. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good outcome. That's a great outcome. Think of it in as broad a terms as customer service. If you know you're going to ask for something back, you probably would do something good in the front. I don't have a problem with that. I hope that's the worst thing people ever figure out. For somebody who's listened to this conversation and maybe either an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, what would be one piece of homework that you would give them as an action step to implement some of the things that we've talked about today. Is this person who's listening an entrepreneur in a startup? What's this? Who is this person? 
Yeah, I would say either somebody who wants to become an entrepreneur or someone who's maybe early in their career and has just started a company or has an early stage company and is looking to grow it. Number one, consider the development philosophy. You're building the product that you want to use. And I think that's, as I said, the richest vein. I would be very susceptible where you're saying, I'm going to build a product that I would never buy. I mean, I just, I can't wrap my mind around that, right? I'm going to help Canva create a product I would never use. Like, how can you evangelize something that you know you wouldn't use? So build something that you would use, or even better, you would love. And I also think that you should never ask people to do something that you would not do. So if you're saying, well, we have a free product, but you have to give us 25 fields of information and your credit card number just so we can verify your identity, who among us would do that for something free? So don't ask anybody to do that. When I go to a website and they say, well, you got 30-day free trial, but give us your credit card now, it's like, oh, God. So you're telling me, I'm going to give you my credit card now. On the 31st day, you're going to bill me, and then you're going to make it impossible for me to get the refund and to stop your billing, right? I have to report the card lost. A third piece of advice is you should hire people who are different from you, not the same. If you're all male, white, tall, Ivy League educated from trust funds in your company, you are going to fail. You need people who are from different walks of life, different perspectives, different experiences. Somebody's good at making, somebody's good at selling. There should be a great deal of heterogeneity in a company, not homogeneity. Great advice. Really, really good perspective. For listeners who want to find out more about you, about the awesome new podcast that you just released and all the exciting people on there, where can people find you and your work online? GuyKawasaki.com is where much of the information about me is, but that's kind of brochure where if you really want to find out on a very personal, non-professional level, what I'm doing, it's Instagram. If you really want to find out what I'm feeling passionate about, and right now I'm highly political, it's LinkedIn. If you want to tap into my ability to connect to people and get them to do interviews, which I don't know how I do it, but somehow I've done it, and to find interesting people than my podcast, I would say the bulk of my intellectual effort right now is my podcast. And for that, people should go to remarkablepeople.com. Awesome. Well, Guy, thank you so much for coming on the show, for sharing your story and all this wisdom. It's been a great conversation. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to The Science of Success. We created the show to help you, our listeners, master evidence-based growth. I love hearing from listeners. If you want to reach out share your story, or just say hi, shoot me an email. My email is matt at successpodcast.com. That's M-A-T-T at successpodcast.com. I'd love to hear from you, and I read and respond to every single listener email. I'm going to give you three reasons why you should sign up for our email list today by going to successpodcast.com, signing up right on the homepage. There's some incredible stuff that's only available to those on the email list, so be sure to sign up, including an exclusive curated weekly email from us called Mindset Monday, which is short, simple, filled with articles, stories, things that we found interesting and fascinating in the world of evidence-based growth in the last week. Next, you're getting an exclusive chance to shape the show, including voting on guests, submitting your own personal questions that we'll ask guests on air, and much more. Lastly, you're going to get a free guide we created based on listener demand, our most popular guide, which is called How to Organize and Remember Everything. You can get it completely for free, along with another surprise bonus guide by signing up and joining the email list today. Again, you can do that at successpodcast.com, sign up right at the homepage, or If you're on the go, just text the word SMARTER, S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. Remember, the greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to a friend, either live or online. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us an awesome review and subscribe on iTunes because that helps boost the algorithm that helps us move up the iTunes rankings and helps more people discover the science of success. Don't forget, if you want to get all the incredible information we talk about in the show, links, transcripts, 
everything we discuss and much more, be sure to check out our show notes. You can get those at successpodcast.com. Just hit the show notes button right at the top. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Science of Success. Mm -hmm.